you guys, let's jump into it. I'm going to talk about sales and influence and how you as a salesperson, whether you're an STR, an account executive, doesn't matter. How can you harness the power of influence to be more effective at selling in today's market? Now, let me take a step back. Years ago, I looked at the world of selling, right? And I realized there's like, you know, when you go online and you do searches for books, you'll find out that 98% of all the books, let's say on Amazon, are dedicated to how to sell. And they fall into three categories. The first category is strategic. Let me go full screen on this. There's the strategic advantage, right? How do you approach your market? Then there's books on tactical face-to-face, belly-to-belly conversations that you have with your client. And last but not least, there's the psychological, you can do it, you're the best, you're the greatest, you can make it happen in sales. And what I realized is the market's changed quite a bit. I think you would agree. Consumers today have more information than ever. They're on their buying journey, whether it's 57%, 75%, 80%, they're on a buying journey. And today's customer is a little different. For example, I started looking at the other side of the equation. Instead of saying, how do I sell to them? I asked myself, well, how do they make a buying decision? How do they buy? Let me move my face down here. How do they buy? And the first one is I said, you know, what motivates a buyer? Like when you're selling to a buyer, what really motivates a buyer to want to make a buying decision? Next, how do they make the buying decision? What is their decision-making process? And then, more importantly, during any conversation, is it possible, is it possible to find moments of influence that can nudge, not push, but nudge a client conversation forward so they can make a buying decision? Now, influence is all around us. All we have to do is harness the power of influence, and guess what? We're on a different track. Years ago, I read the book by Robert Cialdini called Influence, and that was the first kickoff for me into really thinking about how do I begin to understand how buyers make buying decisions? Because again, influence is all around us. Let me give you some examples. Did you know that when you walk into a store like a Walmart or a Target, there's always 10 feet of space in front of the door? Why? Because that's called a transition zone. And what they realize is that when a customer walks through the door, they need to orient themselves before deciding which way to go. Number two, do they go left or right? The answer is the majority go right. Why? Most people say, well, because everybody's right-handed. And to some extent, you're right. But here's the reality. They did a study. When they forced people to go right, people shopped, put stuff in their cart, right? And then they measured the average cart size, in other words, how much they bought. Then they forced people to go to the left, let's say on day two. And then they actually measure how much people actually bought. And on average, people bought more when they went to the right, about 30% more. Why? Part of the answer is because you're right-handed. But think about it. When you're walking this way and it's all right, you're using right hand to pull stuff from the shelf. What they realize that if you go left, since the majority of people aren't left-handed, is that less people will grab less things. Isn't that interesting? Just deciding which way to go will influence how much you buy. How about this one? You ever walk into a store and someone says, hey, can I help you find something? And you go, yeah, no, thank you. But did you know that on average, just by asking that simple question, they boost sales by 30%. Yeah, simply asking that question to engage the customer. Now, here's another one. Here's a glass, and let's say it's filled up to that part. And I ask you the question right now, is that glass half empty or half full? What would you say? Well, the majority of people say it's half full, but the answer is it depends. Now, here's what they did. Imagine two separate rooms. They walk into one room, right? And they showed them an empty glass. And then they filled the glass up halfway. Right? And they asked the people, is that glass half empty or half full? And the majority said it was half full. But then they walked into another room and they had the glass completely filled to the top and then they emptied out half of it. And then they asked them, is that half full or half empty? And the majority said it was half empty. See, sequence matters. What I show you first versus what I show you second makes all the difference. I can frame a conversation if I sequence things correctly. And we'll talk about that in just a bit. But keep in mind that influence is everywhere and just showing people two different sequences, empty, filled up halfway, full, empty down, creates two different perceptions of your product or service. Now, how about this? They did a study. Again, let's just imagine we got one group over here, two group, number two group over here. Now, group one, we're going to give you a car, almost like Oprah, right? We're going to give you a car. It's fully loaded. Let's say there's 10 people in the room. Everybody gets a car. It's fully loaded. And they say to you the following, you can take out whatever you don't want in that car, just take out the options you don't want, and then everybody will have their own car, and then we'll calculate the average price 
of all 10 cars, right? So come up with an average price. Now in this room, they give you the base model. Group two gets the base model. And they say, you can add whatever you want. Anybody can add what they want to their car, 10 people again. And then we'll figure out what each price is for each one of them. And then again, come up with an average. Here's the question. Which group will have a higher average price? Group one, who had the car fully loaded, or group two, who started out with the base model and then built the car? Which one do you think? Well, if you said group one, you're absolutely correct. Here's why. When you have a car that's fully loaded, you've mentally taken ownership of all the features of that car. So to give something up causes you brain pain, right? So to give something up causes you brain pain. So that's why you're gonna keep more items. Now in this case, because you start out with the base model, every time you add something, that causes a different type of brain pain. Ooh, do I really need that? Ooh, that's too expensive, do I really need that? In other words, when you're here and you have a car fully loaded, you're less likely to give something up. But if you have a base model, let's say the bottom line pricing, and you start adding things, you're less likely to add things because it causes brain pain. See, this answers the question. When you're bidding something, should you start high and work your way down, or should you start low and work your way up? The answer is you want to go fully loaded and then let them take out what they don't want, as opposed to trying to sell them a base model and then build them up. Again, two different strategies, two different contexts. We can argue about which one's better given the context, but the psychology here is the same. Once I take mental ownership of something, I'm less likely to give it up. How about this? When we talk about influence, we're talking about how influence is everywhere. So every little thing we do today is about influence. Conversations we're having, tone is influence. Everything is influence. And again, if you can harness the power of influence, learn how to use that in your sales process, then you'll become that much better at selling. In fact, selling will become easier if you know how to put, again, influence into your sales process, which begs the question, what is your sales process? Now, if you're like me, I started out years ago reading books on sales, right? I was in sales, I was in technology sales, big account selling, long sales cycles, and again, I would sell, and I studied the best of the best. I read books like this, for example. I started reading books like this, Strategic Selling. You've probably seen some of these books. I read books like that. I read that book, The New Strategic Selling. I mean, I just, I read like you, a lot of sales books, right? And there's all kinds of books out, Solution Selling, New Conceptual Selling, The Sales Bible, 10 Rules for Selling, you know, again, Technical Sale, Cold Calling, all these books, sell, sell, sell. All these different books on selling, relationship selling, the know-it-all guide to relationship selling, all these sales books. And if you even add more new books on top of that, it becomes somewhat overwhelming. In other words, there's so many books on selling. It's where do you begin? Now, all of these are great books. All of them are great books. So I ask myself the question, what are the common principles in all these books and can it be put into a basic formula? And the answer is... Yeah, it can. I'm gonna show you what I call the universal sales formula. No matter what business you're in, B2B, B2C, doesn't matter. Whatever business you're in, this universal sales formula applies and you'll be able to use it effectively. Here it is. The ultimate universal sales formula brought to you by me. Okay, and here it is. Voila, there's the formula. Get excited. I know, I know. Not that exciting when you look at the formula initially, right? Now. There's only three parts of selling. There really are. I'm going to prove it to you that every book you've ever read on selling, this universal sales formula was in that book. So let's begin with the first letter, E. E stands for empathy. Now at this point, I know what you're thinking, Victor. That's a lot of buildup just to get to empathy. But do you empathize with your customers? Because there's a fundamental difference between sympathy and empathy. Big difference. And most of you are sympathizers, not empathizers. I think I'm gonna prove that in just a bit. Now, what's the difference? Here's a visual. Pretend you're on a cruise ship, you're sipping on a drink, and all of a sudden you see over at the corner, you see a guy who's bent over the banister and he's just puking his guts out, just bleh, just throwing up, right? Not a great visual, is it? But you get the idea. And you stand there with your drink, you go, ooh, that must hurt. That's all you say to yourself, ooh, that must hurt. That's sympathy. Now, if you put your drink down, went over, stood next to the guy, and threw up with him, that's empathy. My question is, is, are you puking with your clients? Are you really throwing up? Do you really feel their pain? 
Let's take the test. Let's see if you are a real puker, a real sympathizer that knows how to vomit with their customers and feel their pain. Because once you feel the customer's pain, you can sell to them more effectively. So here's a company. We all, you're familiar with Hyundai, right? Great company. But when they started out, they had initial problems. They weren't selling a lot of cars. They were trying to gain market share. The problem was people didn't want to buy Hyundai, right? Let me go up here again. What was the problem? The brand was not known. And the perception was that this car was poor quality. So my question to you is, what is the client pain? What is the client pain? Like, what's their pain? Why aren't people buying? Come on, type it in the chat or just, you know, again, anywhere. Just think about it. Write it down. What's the pain? Why aren't they buying? Why aren't they buying, do you think? I'll wait. I'll wait. What do you think it is? Got it? Here was the real pain. They were worried about maintenance. See, the folks who wanted to buy the car, it wasn't about the brand, it wasn't about the price, uh, the color, or the style. They were worried about the maintenance. Like, what if it breaks down? So what did Hyundai do? Understanding this problem, understanding their pain like true pain, Hyundai decides to launch the 10-year, 100,000-mile guarantee. First company to ever do that. See, they understood it had nothing to do with style, it had nothing to do with brand, had nothing to do with price, had everything to do with the fact that people were worried about the maintenance and how much that was going to cost because that's an unknown. So Hyundai knew. They puked with the customer. They understood their pain and they launched this program and boom, sales went up. And then guess what happened? We roll into this tiny period. New problem. We have a recession now. Remember this? We had a recession. All of a sudden, we have a recession Sales start going wah, 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 down, and what happens? What's the client pain? Sales are going down. Why aren't people buying cars? Tell me, why aren't people buying cars? There's a recession going on. Why aren't people buying cars? Is it style? Is it price? What is it? Is it financing? What is it? Hyundai said, well, what it, why, what's holding them back? What's holding them back from buying? Hyundai figured it out. Hyundai said what they're really worried about they puked with their customers. What's really holding them back, what's really keeping them up at night is the fear of losing their job. So what did Hyundai do to solve this problem? They did something interesting. They created something called the buyback prop program. rather. And the buyback program is, says this. If you lose your job, you can return your car and we'll buy it back. I mean, think about that. Marketing implemented that strategy in 37 days. See, Hyundai understood again what the real problems were. Before, when it was maintenance, they knew it was maintenance, they came up with the 100,000 mile tenure guarantee, right? Now they knew that there's a recession and the fear of losing the job was the new pain. So they came up with this new strategy. And what happened? Well, again, let's look at the results. Bottom line is bottom line. After less than a year of using, implementing this program, Less than 100 people actually took advantage of the program, which means people really wanted the car. When they ended the program, less than 350 people actually used the buyback program. But here's the kicker. Here's the big one. Look at that. They went from 7,500 cars a month to almost double. Why? Because Hyundai understood what's holding the customer back from buying. My question to you, in this environment, when people aren't buying, what's holding them back? Don't sympathize, empathize, puke with them. Find out what the real problem is. Don't sell. When you think about an iceberg analogy, the top part of that, you can see 10% of the iceberg, but the 90% is underneath. That 10% is feature benefits advantages, right? What we typically sell. But underneath the water light is the real resistance, what's holding them back. And our job in sales is to figure out what is the real pain that's holding them back and then work to solve that pain. And once you do that, you can then move to the second phase. Once I empathize with my customers, not sympathize, then phase two in the universal sales formula is I educate them. Now, before you say, ah, Victor, that sounds real simple. It's not. Let's talk about education. Back in the 1950s, there's a gentleman by the name of Ernest Dichter. Ernest Dichter is considered the father of motivation research. Not motivation like, woohoo, you're the best. Not that. Motivation research in terms of why do people buy? This is like the original godfather himself, right? And he said something like this in his book, Strategies for Desire. He said, we must make people, this is important, constructively, constructively discontent. In other words, we, we need to make them unhappy 
with what they currently have, but we need to do it constructively. And how do you do that? Well, let me give you an example. Some of you will get this, some of you won't. But back in the day, we had record players, right? We were all happy with the record players. For those of you old enough to remember you baby boomers out there, right? You were happy with the record player. And then what came out? The A-Track. And you're like, wow, for the first time, music became portable. So all of a sudden, you became constructively discontent with that, and you moved over to the A-Track. And you were happy with the A-Track. And then what came out? That is correct. The cassette. You're like, wow. I got more than eight songs. Now I can get 12 songs. I can fast forward to the song I want. This is fantastic. So now I am constructively discontent with that. So I'm going to move over to that. See how it works? And then you're happy with your cassette. And then what comes out? The CD. Did people move over to the CD? Not initially. Something interesting happened. Most people weren't moving over. So the marketing people started to work on, on the mindset of clients who had the cassette. And here's what they highlighted. They came up with a phrase called high fidelity and then described high fidelity like this. What is high fidelity? And they said, go home and listen to your cassette tape. In the background, you're going to hear that noise, right? You won't hear that with a CD. So what do you think most people did? They went back, plugged in their cassette. They never heard the hiss. They hit the play button. All of a sudden, what do they hear in the background? And they're like, ooh, where did that come from? The reality is, the s was always there, but it wasn't until someone pointed it out that you heard it. And once you heard it, you couldn't unhear it. Now, this is important. The hiss was always there, but it wasn't until somebody pointed it out that they finally heard it. And once they heard it, they became constructively discontent and they moved on to the CD. Now, we were happy with the CD. Then where do we go? That's right, the iPod. Now, how did they get us to move over to the iPod? Remember what Steve Jobs said? He said, instead of carrying all these CDs with you on your visor or in your car, you can have a thousand songs in your pocket. Wow. So they're like, I be they became constructively unhappy with their CD and they moved over to the iPod. Then, what did they, how did the iPod die? Well, they said, you don't need to put an iPod. You don't want to carry two devices. Why don't you just carry one device and put your music here? And all of a sudden, you're like, yes. So you became unhappy with your iPod, and now you're on the phone. Now, what's funny is today, they say, you don't want to put your music on the phone. Where do you want to put it? The cloud, right? Somewhere up here. You don't want to put it on the phone. Don't put it here. Put it up there. So they make you unhappy to keep you buying. But the thing is, every time they move us from one product to another, they highlight, if I can say this, the hiss, something that's going to make them unhappy. And see, part of our job is to make clients hear the hiss. Let me give you an example, so a tangible example. They did this interesting study, right? I go into your house. I'm an perf uh, energy performance expert. I'm going to look at your windows. I'm going to look at your doors. I'm going to look at your HVAC, your heating, your air conditioning, your venting system, and tell you where you're losing energy, right? And what I'll do is I'm then going to come up with a list of things that you can do to improve your efficiency, right? And let's say I come to, and I said, I'll say, Bob, I said, I found a list of all these things you can do to improve the energy efficiency in your home. What do you think? And when they said, what do you think? They only closed, on average, 15% of the deals. Only 15%. That's it. When presented to the customer, they only closed 15% of those deals. But then they changed something. Here's what they did. They did the same thing. They reviewed the house, looked at windows, looked at the doors, HVAC, air conditioning, heater, vents. Same thing. Created a list. The same list. Right? But this time, they used a visual. They said, Bob, here's a list of all the inefficiency in your home. Here's where they changed it. Now, Bob, if you add up all these inefficiencies, that would be the equivalent of having a hole the size of a basketball in your wall. And if you had a hole this big in your wall, wouldn't you change it? Wouldn't you want to fix it? And the majority said, yes. All of a sudden, close rates went from 15 to 61%. I mean, think about that. Why? Because visually, what do people start seeing? If this was a hole, they start seeing what? Money going through there. And all of a sudden, they were motivated. When somebody highlighted these things, they go, oh, but isn't that what we're trying to do with clients sometimes? 
Sometimes when we sell a product or service, we want to say, not only are you going to save here, you're going to save here, here, here. And you start aggregating all those losses, and it's almost like the hole the size of a basketball. Now, our job in selling is to what? Have three levels of hisses in this market. In other words, we got to highlight for the customer where they're losing when they're not buying our product. So the first level of hiss is what? The first level of hiss is this, information. If you just give a customer information, they're not going to buy. They're not going to buy, right? Information today is a commodity, not going to buy. But then we've been taught, you know what? You got to give them insight. Give them insight. What's insight? I define insight as information beyond the obvious. But today, insight is table stakes. In other words, everybody provides insight. What you have to do now to be different at selling, to influence the buyer in the sales process, if you got to go to the next level, you got to up your game. You got to go to impact. So with the inside, you have to say, here's how it's impacting your business, your bottom line. The hole the size of a basketball was demonstrating to the customer how it's impacting his money, his revenue, right? How much he's losing every month. Our job is to highlight the in the customer's business. By not using our product or service, Mr. Customer, you're losing money here, 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 here. And if you add all that up, that's the hole the size of a basketball. So our job is to move beyond insight and tie it to impact and how it's impacting their business. Number three, the last part is, if I've empathized with you, if I understand you as a customer, right? I'm throwing up with you, I'm puking with you, right? That's me pushing my gut up, right? And I've educated you, I let you know where I can help you. I've highlighted the areas that you're losing money or revenue or market share. And I'm saying you need to make some changes. People don't wanna be pushed, so we're gonna nudge them. The last step is, I don't like hard closing and neither do customers in today's market. I'm saying you got to ask for the order. There's got to be a call to action. But how do you do it in such a way where you don't push? I always say you just nudge. So we have to empower the buyer to make a buying decision. Here's how you do it. Let me give you a visual example. So I have a UPS mailbox, right? And every year I have to renew this contract, right? So I go to pick up my mail and Sally's there. Sally's behind the counter and she's like, Victor, you need to renew your contract because it's about to expire. Now I had a mailbox right here and I was paying, as you can see, I was paying for that one right there, $220 per month, right? I was good with that. I was good with that. But then I'm realizing I don't get a lot of mail. I don't get a lot of mail. So I look over at the small one and Sally sees me looking at the small one. I said, Sally, how much is this one? She says, Vic, that's $160. Now, Sally knows that I'm leaning towards the least one. You ever have a customer always leans towards the cheapest one? I'm leaning towards the cheapest one. And I know that I want to buy. I'm going to save 60 bucks because to me, 60 bucks is 60 bucks. 60 bucks is like, I don't know, that's like 12 lattes at Starbucks. That's real money to me, right? So 60 bucks is real money to me. So Sally sees me leaning towards the cheaper option. We all have customers who do that, right? So I'm, I'm like, I'm leaning towards this cheap one. I'm looking at this one. I'm not looking at that one. I'm looking at the cheap one right here, right? And so Sally says to me, Victor, let me ask you a question. Now I know what she's going to say because she looks like a great saleswoman. I know what she's going to say. She's going to say, Victor, you want to stay with the big one. Here's why, Victor, because it's easy access. Bigger is better. It's more convenient. Again, you don't have to pick up your mail often. You can do it every two, three weeks. Mailbox won't get jammed, and guess what? Letters won't get crushed, and Victor, you'll be able to handle that big package. Victor, you want to stay with the big box. But that's not what she said. She didn't sell me the features or the benefits of that. She didn't do that. She said, Victor, let me ask you a question. To which I said, what? She said, I understand that you want to save 60 bucks. I get that, she says. She says, but have you considered the following? I said, what? And that's when she went for the pain. She said, or the loss. She goes, if you change your mailbox, you'll have to change your address because this will be a different number. I said, so? I said, on top of that, you'll have to change the information on your business cards if you have that. And I said, okay. And then she says, on top of that, you, I don't know if you edit your own websites, but you'll have to change the information on your websites as well. So I don't know if you have to hire somebody to do that. On top of that, you'll have to well, change all the information on the, all your promotional materials. So you have to go back and do that. On top of that, you'll have to notify your clients that your address or mailbox has changed. Let me ask you a question, Victor. How much time and money is that going to cost you? And I was like, just renew the contract, right? I just like, renew the contract. Now, here's what's interesting. She didn't tell me what to buy. She asked me questions and she shifted my perception. See, I was looking at saving $60.
You ever have customers, again, focused on trying to save $60? But what she did is that she highlighted the big hiss, right? The little hisses that add up to a big hiss. She said, okay, Victor, I, I realize you're focusing on, on saving 60 bucks, but I don't think you understand the true cost of that decision. And she said, here's the true cost. And all she did was shift my attention by simply asking me questions like, if you change this, you'll have to change your address. You'll have to contact your clients. You'll have to change your promotional materials. You have to change your website. And all of a sudden I realized that $60 savings here, it's gonna cost me a whole lot more if I decide to do it. So I decided to just stay with my current mailbox. See, because Sally understood a basic principle in selling. The average salesperson, record this, the average salesperson practices what to say. The best salespeople, the best of the best, practice what to ask. See, by asking the right questions, you can guide a consumer's buying or decision-making process. So on that note, here's the formula all summed up. If I can use the power of influence, I've shown you a couple of techniques just in what we've talked about thus far. But if at first, I can first empathize with my customer, like truly understand what they're going through, what they're struggling with, then I can shift into the next phase of selling, which is to educate them on what we have to offer and how it can alleviate some of those puking pains that they're currently having. And remember, we're not looking for big losses. Sometimes, much like the hole the size of a basketball, remember the, the improvements of energy were small, but when you added up all these small, I call it the aggregation of marginal loss. When you add up all these losses and you aggregate that, now it's a big hole that the customer wants to fix. When we're going through the education process, even the empower process, Sally educated me indirectly, like, Victor, you're, you're, not, you're not seeing the forest from the trees here. You're thinking about just saving 60 bucks, but look at the hassle it's gonna cause you because you're not looking at all these small losses. So again, our job is to educate, but not just give them information. That's commodity. Insight, table stakes. It's how do you tie that insight into how it's gonna impact their business whether it's going to increase their revenue, maybe reduce their costs or expand their market share, how can your product or service do that? And then when you get to the close, so to speak, the call to action, the empowerment piece, it's all about asking the right questions to guide how they actually get there. And on that note, I want to thank you for your time. This is Victor Antonio. My website, victorantonio.com. You can find me online at Victor Antonio. Thank you. And again, Seamless, thank you. Brandon, take care.